Rested and refitted, the 6th Panzer Division, including Panzer Regiment 11, returned to Russia on November 14, 1942. On November 19, the Soviets launched Operation Uranus, a dual attack aimed at the Romanian armies guarding the flanks of the 6th Army in Stalingrad. This operation succeeded in encircling the German forces in the ravaged city. To rescue the encircled German troops, Army Group Don, commanded by Erich von Manstein, planned a counterattack. The 6th Panzer Division, which had just arrived, was the group's strongest armoured unit. Upon reaching Kotelnikovo, Sander, now the leader of the 5th Company, was immediately engaged in combat. He fought alongside one of Germany's renowned Panzer aces, Major Franz Baker, then leading the I Abteilung of Panzer Regiment 11. Their engagement resulted in the destruction of a mixed brigade of Soviet armour and cavalry. Operation Winterstorm, Unter Nehemann Wintergewitter, commenced on December 12, 1942. In the initial two days, with close air support from the Luftwaffe, the 6th Panzer Division made significant headway, despite encountering increasing resistance. Equipped with modern tanks, including the latest Panzer III and long-barreled Panzer IV, as well as attached assault guns, the division was at its peak strength. However, the three German divisions initiating the winter storm faced not the anticipated 10 to 20 motorised Russian divisions, but rather 50 to 60. In total, the Red Army had positioned 185 major combat formations between the German front line and the Stalingrad pocket. While a Russian division was typically considered inferior to a German one, this assumption was no longer accurate in the winter of 1942. By December 15th, the German advance towards Stalingrad had stalled, but the 6th Panzer Division had managed to advance within 48 kilometres of the city. The German army had lost its numerical advantage, sealing the fate of the 6th Army. On December 23rd, the division retreated to counter a new Soviet offensive between the Don and Donitz rivers. This offensive followed the breakthrough of the Italian 8th Army's lines, threatening to encircle all German forces south of the Don and in the Caucasus. Within four weeks, Panzer Regiment 11 suffered heavy losses, including most of its tanks, 35 officers and 400 men. Oberleutnant Sander, wounded by a shell splinter on the night of December 28th to 29, permanently left Panzer Regiment 11. A prolonged period of hospitalisation and recovery ensued, ending with his discharge as unfit for frontline service. We departed from Gur last night, fortunate enough to load up in the evening. The 6th Company of our detachment wasn't as lucky. They had to manoeuvre their heavy tanks onto transport carriages in darkness. We received extra wide winter tracks for our tanks, which we had to manually load onto the railway carriage, a challenging and time-consuming task. Upon arrival at our destination, and with thick snow, mounting these wide tracks will be another strenuous job. Now, in Belgian territory, we encounter bunkers and a small bridge near the ruins of some houses. The river is bordered by steep mountains, where the Belgian king, fond of this landscape, once had a climbing accident. These slopes alone pose a significant barrier, but coupled with bunkers, they are nearly impenetrable. Yet our troops managed to cross the river and surmount these challenges. We are determined to complete our missions and achieve the ultimate victory. We must and will subdue the Russians. This is the Meuse Valley, which I once crossed by bicycle as a boy scout, from Ypres to Kortrijk, then to Waterloo, and finally to Namur. There, during a national holiday, I was detained in a police station because my visa had expired. Having passed He, we find ourselves in the industrial heart of Belgium. Looking out of the train window, one doesn't see the typical face of the Walloon or Belgian, but rather the universal expression of the industrial worker. This expression, marked by sharp and hard features, is common worldwide. It's a reflection of hardship, sorrow, hard labour, misery and hunger. Happiness seldom shines in these eyes. Instead, they often convey the resentment of the modern slave towards those who exploit them. This visage will be a common sight in Russia. In Berlin, such expressions are still seen, though they have mostly disappeared from the rest of the Reich since 1933. In the Belgian coal basin, the hardship and misery are so palpable 
that even the children begging at the train windows bear these marks. We took the time to wash thoroughly before enjoying a hearty breakfast, after which we cleaned the rail cabin. Now everyone is occupied with their personal interests. Young Lindenau, the general's son, is zealously shaving, perhaps in an effort to accelerate his facial hair growth. Meanwhile, Peter and I have opened a bottle of Benedictina, a drink that would have been perfect for New Year's Eve. It leads me to wonder where I'll be at the end of this year, but I dismiss such thoughts as they lead nowhere. Driving through Warsaw, the remnants of the 1939 fighting were still visible. The houses are uniformly grey and dirty, with windows crudely patched up with cardboard and wood. The gardens are unkempt, and the streets are littered with dirt and rubbish, a sign of the Polish capital's decay. The city's architecture seems haphazard, with large buildings erected in the midst of fields in an American style, featuring flat roofs. In stark contrast, there are small panji huts constructed from sheet metal and wood scattered around. In Warsaw, older buildings that predate the World War are evident. Many of these structures bear unrepaired shell damage, similar to what one sees in Thorn. Despite this, the Vistula River, whether near Warsaw, Thorn, Graudence, or in the Danzig area, offers a picturesque view. However, there's a certain melancholy and harshness to this landscape. Our journey doesn't stop in Warsaw, but rather in the Praga suburbs, at a large marshalling yard far outside the city. Here we come across a train full of Luftwaffe infantry, but Herbert isn't among them. We continue rolling onwards. At a station before Warsaw, policemen search poles for hoarded goods. In the short time we are there, they find quite a bit. A woman, crying and pleading with a policeman, utters, Ni ma ni marsh do domu. If only there was no war to witness such scenes. We now traverse an area with sandy, less fertile soil. Most houses are small and wooden, with the only non-inflammable components being the tin roofs and stone chimneys, a common sight in Russia. Occasionally one sees old men and boys wearing the typical square Polish caps. Most trees are bare and the lakes and rivers are thinly iced. We are about halfway through our journey. Once we reach Kharkov, we will still have to march another 300 kilometres. The temperature there is already minus 25 degrees C with plenty of snow. It seems we'll be able to mount our winter tracks upon arrival. We pass a small Polish village, which could easily be mistaken for a Russian one, with its little wooden houses. Something is being loaded onto the train here, likely potatoes. Farmers bring them on long panje carts, which sag in the middle despite not being overly loaded. They wear high-shafted boots, thick jackets, and sometimes caps made of lambskin. We are currently stationed at the marshalling yard in Lidic, where large fuel depots line the tracks. This place, marked by numerous bomb craters left unfilled since the beginning of the war, is a grim reminder of the ongoing conflict. Despite stepping out of the train for some fresh air, we quickly realise that the warm railway compartment remains the most comfortable refuge. A minor mishap occurred when Waffen Oberfeldwebel Raab lost our communal washing bowl at the Warsaw station. He had gone to the locomotive to fetch water when the train unexpectedly started moving. In his rush back to the carriage, he had to abandon the bowl to climb aboard. Now we're left to wash directly at the large tap behind the locomotive. Inside, Peter Schultz is engrossed in playing cards, a hobby I find bafflingly fanatical. Meanwhile, Unterfeldwebel Kroner has retreated into the uppermost luggage net, a shame considering his unsuitability for either aircraft observation duty or acting as a duty officer. Keeping him occupied is necessary to distract him from homesickness, a trait I find particularly irksome in people who can't seem to adapt and incessantly complain. In the backdrop of these personal dramas, I anticipate that Schmausch, Opetz and Bartnek will soon claim some minor ailment. Lidici is busy with several trains, halted due to tracks being sabotaged by partisans, especially active in the Smolensk area. It's likely that the Luftwaffe infantry on the neighbouring trains will be mobilised to counter them. As the locomotive whistles signal our departure, we begin to move again, heading into the encroaching darkness further east. Although it's only evening, the sun sets in a glowing blood-red disc in the west, marking another day in these tumultuous times. My thoughts often drift westward to my beloved wife, 
who lends meaning to my existence in these harsh conditions. We are gradually making our way towards Minsk. The locomotive is now pushing a wagon loaded with sand, a precaution against potential mines on the tracks. Our prolonged station stop yesterday was due to a train carrying soldiers on leave being derailed by a mine. We pass Stolpce and Negorello, locations in eastern Poland near the old Russian border, where bomb craters and destroyed buildings line the tracks. We make a brief halt at a station that has been completely demolished. Nearby, a Russian ammunition train lies in ruins, a testament to our Stuka's work last year. The area is strewn with iron scrap and wheels, remnants of a once chaotic battleground. A wrecked Russian T-26 tank lies abandoned in front of a village, one of many we have encountered and destroyed. Tonight marks a week since we started our journey by train. Outside, snow blankets the landscape, but inside our wagon it's comfortably warm. I sit alone, surrounded by the usual clutter. Our oil lantern sways from the luggage net, nestled among cameras, pistols, canteens, machine pistols in their bags, and wet towels hanging to dry. The nets are crammed with clothing brushes, drinking cups, maps, books, butter tins, cigarette packs and bread. It's a picturesque yet disorderly scene. Last night, under the lantern's flickering light, Peter and I discussed the war. He questioned my reasons for fighting, a query I find difficult to answer succinctly, and one I am reluctant to address. Having passed through Minsk, we continue through the heart of old Russia. Minsk, viewed from afar, resembles other cities we've seen. Small wooden houses interspersed with larger concrete structures. The industrial presence here seems more pronounced than in Vyazma. Many of the modern concrete buildings appear burnt out. Despite the thin layer of snow, the city still looks grimy and worn. We're witnessing Russian prisoners being overseen by Russian guards, who might also be Poles, but they're more likely white Russians. These guards are distinct from the East Russians, who exhibit more Asian features. In Ukraine, it's Russians who are mobilized against the partisans, and we'll probably encounter some of these brothers sooner or later. Despite our southward journey, the landscape remains wintry. We recently stopped at Kursk before turning towards Kharkov. Our progress over the past few days has been swift, thanks to our classification as a rapid transport. This status ensures we receive priority treatment at each stop. Across from me, Peter Schultz is diligently trying to learn Russian, and I'm surprised to find I haven't forgotten as much as I thought. Currently, we all hope not to unload the train at night, but our continued pace suggests that's precisely what will happen. The scenery here, with snow fences lining the tracks and trees adorned with frost, resembles a Christmas postcard. Yet in the context of war, such beauty feels irrelevant. We must remain emotionally detached, no matter how picturesque the surroundings. Between Kursk and Kharkov, the houses differ from those at the central front and bear no resemblance to the grand wooden structures seen near Leningrad. Here they are modest, typically one or two rooms, plastered with mud and often painted white, with straw-covered roofs. The area also has fewer trees, with brushwood and some deciduous trees instead of large pine and fir forests. The night brought fog, reducing visibility to well below 500 metres. This condition, however, benefits us by making aerial detection more difficult. Having experienced an air raid in Chartres, I am not eager for a repeat. Our eventual arrival at our destination promises to bring enough excitement. It's hard to believe how swiftly this week on the train has passed. As we wait to continue, the mood is surprisingly upbeat, possibly because of the likelihood of immediate deployment. This anticipation keeps our nerves from fraying under the strain of inactivity. We are struck by the sight of Russian women who have boarded our train as passengers, travelling in an open wagon despite the cold and heavy snowfall. In Kharkov, they plan to purchase salt for 7.50 RM per kilo, which they'll then sell in Kursk and nearby areas for 20 RM. In Kursk, they intend to buy rye and other grains to sell for profit elsewhere. Carrying enormous sacks, they navigate through the train, climbing onto wagons whenever the Russian railwaymen are distracted. These Russians, clad in multiple layers of warm clothing, seem far more accustomed to the cold than we are apparently undisturbed by the drafty train ride. 
As we progress further south, the snow-covered landscape becomes noticeably warmer, a stark contrast to the chill we experienced at Bryansk. The persistent fog continues to shield us from potential aerial threats. We've been stationary for half a day now. This morning, Major Dr. Bake, the commander of our Abteilung, joined us on our train. We had previously overtaken the staff at Brest, where the commander and our general had travelled on a different train. Our panzer company is set to disembark first, and I'm eager for us to engage the enemy promptly, showcasing the full potential of our well-rested forces. The latest rumour is that we'll be heading via Rostov on the Don. Personally, I'm feeling rejuvenated. A combination of coal pills and mulled wine has worked wonders. Last night, our locomotive broke down, forcing us to endure a lengthy and frigid halt on the tracks. I resorted to using my coat as an additional blanket. When we resumed movement, now pulled by three locomotives, the gradual warming of our carriage felt as comforting as the finest feather bed. Throughout the night and into dawn, we passed enormous industrial complexes, all rendered useless to the Soviets. They had been decimated by our bombs, much like most of the stations we've encountered. This destruction serves as a stark reminder of war's futility. As we continue our journey, the landscape reveals signs of intense combat. Stretching into the distance are anti-tank trenches, earthen bunkers and deep wire entanglements, forming a stark testament to the ferocity of recent battles. Alongside the tracks and in abandoned positions lie remnants of warfare, scrap iron, burnt-out tank hulks and wrecked artillery pieces. Our transport is taking us far south, towards the heavy fighting in Stalingrad. Though we may arrive too late to deliver decisive blows, there will undoubtedly be ample tasks for us. The Russians are far from defeated, launching relentless attacks across the front. I estimate that Russia is capable of producing 600-800 tanks per month, bolstered by equipment supplied by the Americans through Murmansk and Arkhangelsk. In contrast, Germany probably produces 200-300 tanks monthly, a significant portion of which is diverted to Africa to confront the combined forces of the English and Americans. The outcome of this conflict hinges on a critical question. Will spirit, morale and skill prevail, or will it be the sheer mass of industrial output and human resources? The answer to this equation will likely become apparent next year. If mass prevails, our situation will be dire. Alternatively, we may need to adapt to organising a force comparable to what we're encountering in Russia. The train rolls across vast plains that were once abundant with wheat, maize and sunflowers. Occasionally we spot a high slag heap in the distance, similar to those in Belgium, indicative of the rich resources beneath the soil. I find myself wishing we were traversing this land, not for war, but for reconstruction, collaboration and cultivation. Imagine a world where workers from all warring nations unite for a peaceful, prosperous future for themselves and their children. Will we forever stand in opposition, or will there be a day when we stand together? I yearn to witness such a day and to share these stories with my children. Our train is now laboriously ascending a slope along the Don River, heading towards the city. The locomotive strains, hissing and puffing white smoke. Unless we reach the hill's crest soon, we risk coming to a complete halt. We are now rolling into Rostov, a city for which we have fought intensively in the spring and the previous year. Since passing Novocherkask, our journey has been marked by the sight of a long line of destroyed freight trains. Hundreds of locomotives and thousands of railway wagons are lined up, one after the other, all ravaged by our bombing. It appears there was an attempt to relocate the contents of factories from the Donitz Basin to areas east of the Volga. The wagons are filled with a variety of industrial equipment, electric engines, transmissions, steam boilers, pipes, lathes, drills and more. Interspersed among these are blown up ammunition transports, scattering shells and casings over miles. It's a scene both unforgettable and tragic. Upon entering a station, we encounter Romanians on the opposite platform. Some of our soldiers jeer at them, but they quiet down when some of the Romanians respond in German. Among them are Volksdeutsche, who engage us in conversation about our origins and destination. In a surprising turn, their train departs without them, eliciting a nonchalant response. Ah, well, never mind. 
The Romanians, generally resembling gypsies, wear tall lambskin caps and are seldom seen clean. We also come across members of the Italian Air Force, who leave a reasonably favourable impression. We briefly stopped at Rostov's main station, but have already crossed the Don River. The crossing over a massive bridge offered an excellent view of the city, a vast expanse with many large high-rise buildings, most of which are destroyed. Burned out, collapsed from bombings or damaged in combat, the city bears the scars of war. Many buildings are constructed in a rough American style, with enormous dimensions. The area around the bridge is pocked with bomb craters. On the other side of the Don lies Bataisk, and the land between Rostov and this town is a marshy floodplain, interlaced with several bridges and dams, creating a complex and challenging landscape. Alongside the railway runs a road, blanketed by an unending column of transport lorries delivering fuel and ammunition to the front. Flanking the road are large numbers of Russians, some on foot, others pushing carts or riding small panja carts. They transport large sacks of grain, acquired in Ukraine, hoping to exchange them for salt. Now our train carries more Russian women and men than German soldiers. Among them a few appear relatively clean, but most look scruffy, dirty and unkempt. A woman recently passed through the carriage, likely having shopped in Rostov. She carried a new broom over her shoulder, to which a large wire sieve was attached. Draped around her neck was one of those striking Ukrainian shawls, and something wrapped in her bright red headscarf accentuated the fabric's woven pattern. We've taken aboard a Romanian Hauptmann and a few of his men as passengers. However, there's a general sense of discontent with the Romanians following the recent events in the Don Salient. Observing the local traffic is fascinating. Numerous Russian soldiers, identifiable by their white militia armbands, hustle about. These armbands signify their service under our command. Many carry bags over their shoulders for their rations, reminiscent of the French soldiers. The robustness of these individuals is notable. Interestingly, women here undertake tasks typically reserved for strong men in Germany. Alongside the railway, numerous girls and women wield heavy pickaxes at construction sites. Some carry hefty railroad ties and planks, while others work on the roads with shovels and picks. This observation, first made during my time in Thorn, underscores the physical labour Slavic women often perform. Our train is now increasingly occupied by comrades from various service branches, all hitching rides to rejoin their units. With no regular railway service to the Stalino region, this makeshift mode of transport is their only option. We've cleared the Russians from the baggage wagons, which are now filled with German troops. It's evident they're from frontline units by their casual demeanour around US officers. An experienced Lanza knows his limits in interaction and who he can be informal with. I should note that we all enjoyed a wonderful bath this morning. In an old railway repair shop at Novacherkask station, the duty unteroffizier discovered a shower room with warm water. We seized the opportunity, ordering the entire company to shower, which turned out to be quite successful. Donning fresh underwear, we all felt as rejuvenated as newborn babies. However, I wonder how long this sense of freshness will last. Tomorrow we'll arrive at our destination and unload the train, marking the end of our journey and our farewell to the comfort of our wagon. The questions of when, how and where we'll return loom large. Currently, Lindenau and Feldwebel Fink, an older officer candidate and the brother of our Fink from Abteilung 65, are engaged in a game of chess. Fink, at 30, had probably envisioned a different role for himself. As a doctor, he aspired to be a court officer and was less than thrilled with his transfer to our combat unit. It remains to be seen how he will adapt. He has the potential to be a good soldier and is certainly not lacking in intelligence. Our departure time is still uncertain. Down here, everything is either completely undecided or shrouded in secrecy. There's flak fire above Rostov, likely targeting a Russian reconnaissance plane. The actual situation in the Don Salient is unclear, and the army communique offers no clarification, leaving us reliant on rumours. These rumours, born in latrines, are initially believed, then debated, and eventually forgotten. The candle in the bottle here provides insufficient light, casting a dim glow in our cramped space.
It's best for me to conclude here as I don't want to strain my eyes in the dim light. Tomorrow promises a return to more engaging activities. Meanwhile, some unter have started to stoke our little wood stove, but it's producing so much smoke that visibility is now quite poor. However, the smoke has somewhat invigorated me, allowing me to spend a little more time with my thoughts and diary. There's not much else to do. The light is barely sufficient for playing cards or taking a nap, and reading would only harm the eyes. Our journey from Novochakask to Rostov took us alongside a tributary of the Don River. On one side we witnessed endless rows of destroyed vehicles, while on the other the river shimmered. A man in a red cap, mounted on a sinewy horse, raced alongside us on the opposite bank. I recognise him from earlier. He's the commander of the Russian militia we saw training at the station. With his appearance and demeanour of an old Tsarist officer or NCO, and his snow-white hair, he cuts a striking figure in his uniform. He was commanding his troops impressively, counting their steps during a turn, Raz, DVA, Tri, Chetir, his motley crew of white Russians marching in good order. We all watched their drill, our allies, brothers at arms. I couldn't help but think how we could use many more like them. Imagine if we had 60,000 Circassians and Kalmyks for anti-partisan duties and infrastructure construction, that would free up enough manpower for four solid divisions, an entire corps. We Germans are in dire need of human resources. Initially, we didn't do enough to win over Russian prisoners, and there wasn't sufficient food to sustain millions of them. The newly conquered territories offered little yield, as the Jews and commissars had destroyed much of the valuable resources. It's not an ideal situation, but dwelling on it is unproductive. The more pressing concern is the welfare of our comrades who have been captured. That's the fundamental issue we face. Today marks the third Sunday we've spent on the rails, crossing the Kalmyk Steppe. This area of Russia, the birthplace of Lenin, the founder of the Soviet Union, is a testament to the concept of vastness. The steppe stretches endlessly, occasionally broken by a sparse village. It's around these villages that one finds the only semblance of trees in this landscape, although they're more like tall bushes than actual trees. The houses nestled among them are modest in height, a noticeable trend beginning in Ukraine. This likely stems from the difficulty in sourcing building materials, a task much easier in the forested regions around Leningrad and the central sector. In northern and central Russia, house construction typically involves stacking logs horizontally. However, here in the steppe, logs are placed vertically, and then covered with thin wooden boards, which are subsequently smeared with a mud and straw mixture. Once dried, these walls are lime-washed, creating a distinct architectural style. We're now approaching a station that services a remarkably modern village, indicative of a prosperous community. An enormous grain silo stands adjacent to the railway, equipped with large suction lifters that enable the direct transfer of grain from trains into the silo. Along the railway, there are extensive storage halls and wind-powered water pumps mounted on tall steel frames. Today's journey has been quite enlightening. We made a stop at Salsk, where I observed several large armoured trains. Originally belonging to the Russians, these trains have been captured and are now stored here. The sight of these formidable war machines, repurposed and lined up, adds another layer to the complex tapestry of this ongoing conflict. These armoured trains, observed during my brief washing and shaving routine, will be instrumental in anti-partisan operations in the central sector. Their formidable presence would also be advantageous in Serbia, where the partisan situation mirrors that of central Russia. Regrettably, I didn't have time to explore them internally. One locomotive, notably named Kosomolts, and others similarly bore names evocative of the Red Revolution. The area is teeming with Romanians, many of whom appear to have abandoned their posts. Hundreds are seen queuing at our distribution points, pleading for food. This abandonment shifts the burden of frontline engagement onto the German troops. In conversation with a Volksdeutsche soldier from the Romanian army, a 32-year-old mechanic and Banat Swabian, I gleaned some insight into the demographic changes in Romania. Following the loss of Transylvania, Romania's population decreased from 18 million to 12 million, yet they still managed to raise an army of 2 million men. 
Before Transylvania's loss, official Romanian counts estimated 800,000 to 900,000 Germans in the region, but the German Foreign Office now records over 1 million Germans, primarily in the Banat. The Romanian military presence extends from the northern part of the Danube's Great Bend to the Kalmyk Steppe. The rank-and-file Romanian soldiers receive a meagre monthly pay of just one mark, with their families at home receiving no support. The disparity in treatment between ranks is stark. Officers and NCOs enjoy separate kitchens and better food, while the enlisted men are left with inedible leftovers. However, the situation has somewhat improved with the regular provision of German rations. Romanian companies, lacking regular motor pools, resort to any available vehicles and are often accompanied by a menagerie of chickens, geese, sheep, goats and cattle, reflecting a rather unorthodox approach to military logistics. A Romanian marching column is indeed a unique spectacle. Despite being a mechanic, the Volksdeutsche I spoke with has been conscripted into a horse hospital unit, which comprises 450 men, including 70 Germans. They had a challenging journey, arriving two weeks ago in cramped railway freight wagons. Remarkably, their commander and several senior officers and officials brought along their families, personal livestock and belongings. This added burden forced 68 enlisted men into each wagon, making for an extremely congested journey. His younger brother has managed to cross over to German territory and is now serving in a German pioneer unit. When I inquired whether they had access to items from the sutler, he was unfamiliar with the concept. Explaining that we receive personal items like tobacco and extra rations through such means, he responded with surprise, noting that they had been promised three blank postcards per person, a promise that was never fulfilled. According to him, the morale among the Romanians was initially positive, but has since deteriorated due to a sense of betrayal by their officers. He recounted an incident in his friend's unit where the commander and all officers had abandoned their posts three days before a major Russian attack on November 20th, heading east instead of west. During the Russian assault, the unit was left leaderless, with scant ammunition. NCOs instructed the men to conserve their limited ammo by allowing the Russians to approach closer before firing. But as the enemy neared, the troops, feeling overwhelmed and leaderless, discarded their rifles and fled. Similar stories are emerging from various fronts. In Obliaskaya, for example, disorganised groups of fleeing Romanian troops resorted to blowing up their own ammunition depots and setting their fuel supplies alight. In a shocking turn of events, a Romanian major at the Luftwaffe airfield there ordered his men to torch a German supply train laden with fuel, illustrating the depth of disarray and desperation among their ranks. In a recent incident, a Luftwaffe Hauptmann had to fatally shoot a Romanian officer with his pistol. Near the town, a conflict escalated when a Romanian major struck a German Feldwebel with his riding whip. In response, the Feldwebel shot the Romanian officer dead. This case was brought before the liaison staff, resulting in a reprimand for the Romanians while the Feldwebel was exonerated. The underlying principle was clear. One does not assault a German. The Romanians have gained a reputation for pilfering anything unsecured. Bruno Gerlach, a Kriegsverwaltungsrat attached to the liaison staff, recounted an incident in a hospital train near Rostov. He had placed his golden wristwatch on a bench while washing, and it disappeared following the passage of a Romanian leutnant and an Oberleutnant. Despite Gerlach's confrontation and subsequent official complaint, the officers denied the theft maintaining the stance that a Romanian officer does not engage in such acts. The situation was dismissed as a joke. Our train has come to a halt, apparently out of steam. I've lit a candle in an empty cognac bottle to prolong my writing. A young infantry leutnant sits beside me, playing melancholic tunes on his harmonica. The sun has set, leaving an orange glow that fades into grey, blurring the distinction between sky and earth. The candlelight creates a cosy atmosphere, and I settle into a more comfortable position to listen to the Leutnant from Dusseldorf. He's not much older than our Linda now, perhaps a bit more impudent. My initial impression of him was reinforced during our conversation, where I learned he had been confined to his quarters for misconduct in his replacement unit in Belgium.
The young infantry lieutenant shared his story of insubordination, which led to his current predicament. He had irreverently questioned his company commander's intelligence in the officer's mess, likening the acidity of the champagne to its effect on the commander's calcified brain. This audacity was compounded when he crashed a staff car into a tree while en route to Namur. These incidents culminated in his transfer to the Eastern Front, but now he finds himself aimlessly drifting for 16 days, as the unit he's assigned to is encircled in Stalingrad. Many German soldiers are in a similar state of limbo due to this situation. Meanwhile, the Romanians are exploiting the chaos, retreating across the Don towards the rear. Their discipline is compared to a herd of pigs, a stark contrast to their previous tolerable cooperation. It's rumoured that the two Romanian armies in the east have suffered immense losses, with casualties reaching 200,000 dead, excluding the wounded. Russian propaganda flyers encouraging desertion to their side are being dropped over Romanian lines, promising greater rewards for fighting alongside the English and Russians. However, rather than defecting, the Romanians seem to be simply fleeing. I noticed that the Romanian soldiers typically wear tall fur caps. Curious, I asked the Volksdeutscher why he wasn't donning one. He explained that while the Romanians prefer these caps, they're unpopular among the Germans. His appearance stood out, with shiny clean boots and expertly bound puttees, a stark contrast to the unkempt look often associated with the Romanian troops, derogatorily nicknamed swineherds by the German soldiers. The state of the Romanian NCOs is equally poor, and their officers are described as utterly repulsive, highlighting a significant disparity in military discipline and appearance. The Romanian officers are reminiscent of the Polish intelligentsia of the past, as described by Galash from the liaison staff. He paints a picture of their highbrow preferences. They shun field kitchens, insisting instead on three-course meals served on tables adorned with white tablecloths. The notion of a Romanian officer fighting in the front lines alongside their men seems unheard of, a sentiment echoed by the Volksdeutsche soldier I spoke with. Curious about his views on resettlement to the old Vortigau or West Prussia, I inquired about his thoughts. He explained that his ancestors had migrated to the Banat from the Schwarzwald and Alsace-Lorraine over three centuries ago. They had toiled hard to cultivate the land, which only recently achieved peak fertility. Moving to East Germany or elsewhere would mean adapting to a new climate and soil, essentially starting from scratch. War administrator Galash, a native of Koblenz, is an interesting character. A devout Christian and academic, he's also an avid hunter with his own grounds in the Westerwald. Blessed with five children and over 50 years old, he's quite talkative, albeit with a pessimistic streak. His keen ability to discern the world's darker aspects makes him particularly intriguing. Just now, he sat opposite me, engaging in cartomancy. He arranges the cards in two rows, then removes any that are adjacent to, above, or below another of equal value. According to his belief, if he can lay out the entire deck without removing any cards, it signals bad luck. Conversely, if he's able to remove the entire deck within five attempts, it supposedly indicates that we will all be returning home soon. To calm his nerves, Galash indulges in card games and tricks, a pastime I understand well. However, I often find that his penchant for talkativeness sometimes leads him to speak carelessly, not fully considering the potential impact of his words. It's now 5pm, and it has been completely dark outside for over an hour. Following Galash's card tricks, we entertained ourselves with ancient jokes about Tunis and Shal, modified with a contemporary twist, and also jokes involving Jop gobbles. These sparked great amusement and laughter among us. Herr Schmitz then began recounting his hunting escapades in the East, claiming to have seen and hunted wolves. I'm sceptical of his tales, having travelled extensively from the Volga Moscow Canal to the Dnieper, including time spent in the dense forests around Leningrad. I've never encountered wolves. Schmitz seems to have spent most of his time in staff orderly rooms, so his stories, while entertaining, appear exaggerated. His complaints about those in comfortable positions back home ring hollow to me. Despite his grumbling, he's far better off where he is, though he doesn't seem to recognise it. 
He embodies the archetype of the eternal Philistine, always seeking comfort and convenience. This morning we passed the chain of lakes along the Manic River. The Russians had dammed the river, causing water levels to rise near the railway embankment we were crossing. The vastness of the scene was a remarkable natural spectacle, making us feel insignificant in comparison. Our company, along with Panzer XI under Hauptmann Hofmeyer, was stationed in the village of Nagolnij, near Kotelnikovo. On Monday, November 30th, we disembarked at Semichnaya, a nondescript place along the railway from Rostov to Stalingrad. After the lengthy train journey, we began winterizing the lorries with the provided kits. The maintenance platoon was diligently working when, at 11 a.m., a messenger from the armoured personnel carrier battalion arrived with orders for me to contact the battalion staff. Frustratingly, the telephone wasn't functioning, and a call to Kotelnikovo was impossible. The adjutant of Hauptmann Kuppers informed me that the general had called, instructing us to prepare for action. In Hauptmann Hofmeyer's absence, who was out on reconnaissance, I attended a staff briefing led by the IAA. Our company was to ready itself for immediate departure. As interim commander, my responsibility extended to our group, including Peter Schultz, who led the first platoon. This development stirred considerable excitement. I instructed my luggage to be packed and, accompanied by Krosh, the commander's Kubelwagen driver, and Voss, I headed to Kotelnikovo to meet with Oberst Unrein, the commander of Panzergrenadier Regiment 4 at the Staff HQ. The atmosphere there was one of bustling activity, indicating significant upcoming operations. I reported our company's readiness and awaited further instructions, only to be reprimanded for not using the phone to communicate. Upon my return, I led my company from Nagolnij to Kotelnikovo. Hauptmann Hofmeyer, back from his meeting with the general, guided us to the village's western exit. He perched on the turret of my Panzer III, joined by Peter Schultz, to brief us on the tactical situation. Despite the challenge of a whipping wind and heavy snow making our map soggy, we learned that the Russians had overrun the village of Poklobin that morning, capturing most companies and our batteries. Now they were preparing to attack Kotelnikovo, with a formidable force including at least 20 tanks and a substantial cavalry contingent, supported by long columns of infantry. Our SPW battalion and our two companies were assigned the task of annihilating these Russian forces. At 1.30pm, we assembled on the steppe for the counterattack. The scene was impressive. Over 30 armoured giants, followed by roughly 100 armoured personnel carriers, transporting our grenadiers, raced across the snow-covered plain, presenting a formidable and awe-inspiring sight. My heart raced with anticipation. Such a formidable force surely foretold a successful assault. Hauptmann Hofmeyer was the epitome of an adept leader, perfectly suited for an operation demanding speed and agility. We traversed the airfield and the road from Kotelnikovo to Mayorovsky. In the distance, a cluster of vehicles on a hill caught our attention, likely Russian tanks. To our left, more vehicles nestled in a hollow. A brief pause allowed us to survey our surroundings through binoculars, but the dense snowfall severely limited our visibility. With no other choice, we propelled forward towards the enemy. I instructed Schultz, Opetz and Matusik via radio to stay vigilant and report any sightings. Noticing that the vehicles on the hill, except for two stationary T-34S, were retreating to a reverse slope position, we continued our charge. The vehicles on our left appeared to be German lorries and reconnaissance cars, posing no threat. Our advance, however, was abruptly halted by a balka, a ravine half filled with water, forming an insurmountable barrier for our tanks. It was at this moment that the battle truly commenced. From about 2,000 metres away, the Russians unleashed a barrage of fire. This intense combat was a stark contrast to the relatively peaceful time we had spent in France, where our only exposure to gunfire was during modest training exercises. A tracer shell whistled over our turret, impacting the ground behind us, a clear indication of the enemy's resolve. We needed to find a position to effectively return fire. Our artillery attempted to provide cover by launching smoke into the Russian positions, but the strong winds quickly dispersed it, leaving us exposed to relentless enemy fire. 
I commanded the 7.5 centimetres armed vehicles to launch smoke rounds directly at the Russian guns in a desperate attempt to obscure their vision. But this too proved futile. The intensity of the battle was escalating rapidly, challenging our strategies and resilience in the face of a determined adversary. In the escalating intensity of battle, our position became increasingly precarious. Hofmeyer's company, intended to attack from the left, was still obstructed by the Balka. Under the relentless Russian barrage, my men advanced more cautiously, and without realising it in the chaos, I had moved slightly ahead of them. We needed to close the distance, as our five centimetres guns were ineffective against the Russians at a range of 1,500 to 2,000 metres. Our advance was soon hindered by another section of the Balka that had stalled Hofmeyer's company, forcing us to veer right. Driving alongside a rainwater ditch, we sought a crossing point. During a brief halt, we attempted to target one of the T-34S on the hill, but to no avail. Leading in my vehicle, I urged the platoons of Opets and Schultz to quicken their pace. As more shells struck the ground around us, a sudden, powerful blow halted my tank. Müller, the driver, informed me through the earpiece that a shell had broken our left track. Despite the situation, I couldn't help but smile at his Thuringian accent. We were fortunate to be able to still fire, so I ordered the crew to continue engaging the enemy. While assessing the rest of the company's actions, I witnessed Unteroffizier Stefan's tank, 502, take a direct hit on its turret. The crew scrambled to escape just before a second shell ignited fuel canisters on the engine deck, engulfing the tank's rear in flames. It was unclear if all had managed to escape, as some crew members sought cover in the steppe. Frustration and anger boiled within me. At 1,500 metres, we were being decimated without any chance of effective retaliation with our 5 centimetres guns. With my vehicle immobilised and my backing vehicle destroyed, I handed over the company's command to Peter Schultz. However, he and his platoon had already moved far right in search of a passage over the Balka. The situation was dire, with our forces scattered and under severe pressure from the enemy's relentless assault. Unable to connect with Hofmeyer on my left, I made the decision to exit my tank and run towards him. Sprinting across the short distance, I clambered onto his tank to communicate directly. This proved perilous, as several shells exploded nearby, sending splinters dangerously close to my head. I hastily descended, shouting up to him to convey my message and to understand his plan for handling the situation. According to Hofmeyer, my company was to provide covering fire while our forces retreated towards Mayorovsky. Once the fallback was complete, I was to regroup with them there, planning for a renewed attack from this new position the following day. I boarded Opetz's tank, directing Peter Schultz's platoon to retreat to the road leading to Mayorovsky. Schultz's response was inaudible amid the chaos, but his actions indicated comprehension as the vehicles began to move. I stayed behind the Balka with Matusik and Opetz's platoons until nightfall. In a remarkable effort, Feldwebel Matusik and his men managed to repair the track on my tank, working perilously close to Stefan's fiercely burning tank, which was periodically rocked by exploding ammunition. Once repaired, we joined the others on the road. I intermittently fired signal flares to navigate through the blinding snowfall and pitch-black night. Eventually we crossed the Balka and its smaller offshoots, rejoining the road. Along the way we passed some of the grenadiers in their armoured half-tracks. After crossing an old, fragile bridge, the initial intended point of attack, we reached the village and received orders from Oberst Zollenkov. Following a period of waiting, we rolled through the village and, positioning against its outermost houses, formed a defensive half-circle, reinforced by Company Schaefer from the SPW battalion. In the village, I secured accommodations for myself and my crew in a small house adjacent to Hauptmann Schaefer's billet. After receiving a briefing from Oberst Zollenkopf, I retired to my quarters. Surrounded by an array of religious icons, I soon fell into a deep sleep, mercifully free from the haunting turmoil of my dreams.